right, welcome to part nine of the Lackawanna cutoff. Rails under and over the cutoff. Hi, I'm Chuck Walsh, and I'm president of the North Jersey Rail Commuter Association. And yes, here we are at Port Morris again. Although we've moved to a slightly different location, we're physically located on the right-of-way of the cutoff, and there's a train coming, so I'm gonna move over here, and we're gonna get a shot of a train coming. not on the cutoff, but uh, nevertheless, I mean, this train. Today we're going to be looking at places where trains used to run, and uh, one place where they still run. So, I'm going to let you watch the train. I'm, I'm, I'm better entertainment than I am. steal the show again. He's just pulling into the yard. What we're going to be doing today is visiting the different places on the cutoff where railroads, I'll say an expanded definition of railroad, went either under or over the cutoff. There are actually eight different places along the cutoff where that happens, involving six different railroads as a matter of fact. Now, we should, I should point out that there's no place on the cutoff that, where there's actual any kind of interchange between uh, the railroad and the actual cutoff itself, except at the opposite ends, here at Port Morris, for example, and at Slateford, which we'll also visit at the very end of our trek today. So, our first stop will be a place where we visited during the episode on the Pequest Phil, the Sussex Railroad or the Sussex Branch at Andover. Hi, here we are on the Sussex Branch, or at one time the Sussex Railroad, where it goes under the cutoff. Now in our episode about the Pequest Phil, we were on the opposite side, now we're on what would be the south side of the cutoff. This is Andover, and Andover is, the center of Andover is maybe about a half a mile north of us here. The Sussex Branch originally started as a mule railroad. In other words, a railroad where they didn't have steam locomotives, but rather they had mules that pulled cars on track. And we're talking now back in the 1850s. By the time of the Civil War, the, the railroad had converted to a steam railroad and in fact it uh, reached all the way to Newton, which is uh, good five, six, seven eight miles from here north of uh, this location. And then in 1864, our friend John I. Blair comes into the picture. Uh, he and I'll say cooperation with the Lackawanna Railroad or the Morris and Essex uh, acquires this railroad and it becomes part of the, the Lackawanna family of railroads, if you will. Now, all the railroads we're going to be visiting today, there's one thing they have in common, and that was that they were here first. In other words, uh, if you look at a map from about 1900 or so, all these railroads that we're going to see today were there, with the one exception, I should say, um, over in Pennsylvania. So the cutoff would really was, uh, if you look at a map of northern, northern New Jersey, or even New Jersey as well for railroads, 
uh, the cutoff is going to be conspicuously absent until it's built in 1911. Now, uh, service on the Sussex branch lasted until 1966. Actually, I should point out that the Sussex branch, to remind you, uh, ran from Netcong through here and at Branchville Junction went westward to Branchville and then uh, eastward to Franklin and um, you know, that neck of the woods there. By 1964, the last of the freight traffic that was left on the, on the branch north of uh, Newton, and that was the Becker Dairy Farm at Straters, uh, which at one time was a, a big business. Uh, milk was a big business, livestock and, and so forth. Uh, was a big business, but by that time, the traffic had died to the point where it couldn't sustain the, the, the branch. So in 1964, everything north of Newton was abandoned. Uh, skipping back in time, going back to the Sussex branch, or Sussex Railroad rather, uh, this was built primarily for iron ore, or uh, so that, uh, which would be mined and, and basically brought somewhere else to be smelted and uh, into into iron basically however the the quality of the ore here was so poor and there were a couple of mines that were in the area this is going even back to the time of the mules that eventually they were replaced by uh, mines that were not in this area and not in New Jersey at all as a matter of fact now, as we get to the end of the life in terms of uh, rail service, uh, commuter service in particular, that would last through 1966 when the Erie Lackawanna, uh, which took over in 1960 um, for the Lackawanna, the Erie Lackawanna cut back a number of different routes, and one of them was the, the Sussex branch, which was, um, which was discontinued. However, the line still stayed intact, and uh, that would cause problems, at least from the Erie Lackawanna management's point of view, because in the mid-1970s, there was a proposal to run trains from Hoboken. These are, we're talking about uh, commuter type or passenger type of trains, and to run them all the way through here, um, up th through the, we have a biker coming. See, that's the danger of, of, of doing a, a video on uh, a trail. Uh, this is a trail, by the way, as well, as you have now imagine, the Sussex Branch Trail. Um, but in talking about the, uh, the proposal to run a passenger train up this branch to what would be the uh, the Playboy Club at Vernon uh, which became known as a potential for bunny trains as they were called now the bunny trains were never run as it turned out um, there was problems with funding and the Erie Lackawanna Railroad did not want to have get back into the passenger service business and probably adding into this, uh, in, in terms of the decision, and we're talking about now Hugh Hefner, who's pushing for um, a casino license, actually, in Vernon. Um, trains that would have run through here and up to Andover Junction on the Lehigh and Hudson River Railroad, and then all the way up to Vernon. Um, had he been able to secure a, a casino license, that might have changed things, but he, he wasn't, and as we know, uh, the casinos ended up in Atlantic City as it turned out. So while this was going on with the, the, the proposal for the bunny trains, the Erie Lackawanna decided this is a good, as good a time as any to stop this and they actually removed the part of this branch. So that made it basically impossible for any trains to be run and it became a moot point. And uh, uh, so the, the bunny trains never happened. 
uh, it would have been an interesting run if it actually had occurred, but um, circumstances dictated against that, or conspired against it, you might say. So, um, that's, here we are, Andover. Um, our next stop is going to be, uh, oh, by the way, we're, I should say that we're about 10 miles, 9 10 miles west of Port Morris. Um, our next stop is going to be at the Lehigh and Hudson River Railway underpass. And we'll also talk a little bit about the connection between that and this route. And one final thing I should point out is that the Lehigh and Hudson River, which is the next stop, had trackage rights through here. Say, so why would they have that? Well, they went to Port Morris Yard, where we just came from, uh, at one time. Uh, before the merger between the Erie and the Lackawanna, uh, the Lehigh and Hudson River Railway had trackage rights from Andover Junction, maybe two or not even three miles from here, all the way from here up to um, what would be Port Morris. Anyway, just a parenthetical remark on that. But anyway, so our next stop, Lehigh and Hudson River Railway underpass, a lot of stuff to talk about over there. Here we are at the Alamucci Freight House in Alamucci, New Jersey. Uh, we decided to make a detour. I told you that we were going to go over to the underpass uh, for the cutoff on the Lehigh and Hudson River Railway. Uh, but since we're going to talk about a particular train that stopped here, I think this is a good time and a good place to do that. The time is uh, September 1st, 1944 probably somewhere near dawn, as it turns out, a special train carrying President Franklin Delano Roosevelt has gone from Washington overnight, Washington, D.C., and instead of going via the, the route that would take him through New York and over the Hellgate Bridge, which um, was one of the excuses that was used to detour, quote unquote, via this route here. Uh, that was basically nonsense, but anyway, that was an excuse that was given at the time. Um, the special train was taking uh, President Roosevelt from the White House, Washington, to his home in Hyde Park, New York. Now the question is, why would he stop here? Uh, well, a little bit of history is, is required. Um, Back in his early days, back in, well, this would be in his 30s, uh, he became friends with uh, uh, a woman by the name of Lucy Mercer. And uh, to make a long story short, it almost ended his marriage with Eleanor Roosevelt, who would become first lady when Roosevelt was elected as the 32nd president in 1933. That relationship was broken up by the mother and um, to make a long story short that, that uh, Roosevelt and, and Mercer um, stayed out of contact for a number of years. However, after Roosevelt became president uh, that relationship was rekindled and at the time uh, when we fast forward to 1944 um, there uh, very much still in contact. Now, at that time, uh, Lucy Ru uh, Mercer had become Lucy Rutherford. She had married and subsequently her, her husband had died several years earlier uh, than 1944. So in any case, uh, this stop on the 1st of September of that year was for Roosevelt to meet up with uh, Lucy Rutherford, whose estate is just no more than a couple of miles from here, as a matter of fact, up the hill. And that particular estate is still open. Uh, uh, you can visit it. Uh, now, when the train stopped here, um, no one really quite knew what was going on. They didn't really tell the press. The press was with them. But in those days, the press didn't really uh, tell a whole lot about the, the bad things that might have been going on or any kind of uh, mysterious things. And certainly the, the fact that uh, President Roosevelt was 
was disabled. He had been he contracted polio when he was about 40 years of age, and he had lost the the use of his legs. So what happened was the Ferdinand Magellan, which was the private car in which he traveled in, uh, was stopped here. And there's a photo which we'll show you uh, with the Ferdinand Magellan. Uh, the rear of it just poking out a little bit from this particular platform here. And while we don't have photos of how the, the rest of this worked, where there was actually some sort of lift that was uh, devised just for the special use of President Roosevelt, and that lift would have allowed the, his wheelchair to be basically dropped onto this, and then somehow they would have carried him off onto a, a waiting car, and uh, off they went for a few hours, and they came back. But uh, the press rarely ever took photos of uh, President Roosevelt um, to, to highlight his disability, but he was certainly the, uh, uh, he, he certainly overcame that, or at least he, it wasn't something that was highlighted, but it probably was one of the worst kept secrets as, in terms of um, how he had to overcome uh, well, polio certainly, uh, but his uh, disability, the loss of the use of his legs, basically. Now, to finish the story, uh, Roosevelt comes back, and he really wanted to come back via this route. It was a, sort of a, a secret route coming uh, from the Lehigh and Hudson River, which is a um, basically, well, when they stopped here, it was in the middle of nowhere, but the, the route was considered to be in the middle of nowhere. But it ended up bringing him home, you know, pretty much. Uh, safe and sound, although Eleanor apparently had some suspicions about what was going on. But um, uh, to finish the story, uh, Lucy Rutherford would be um, by Roosevelt's side when he died the following April, April of 1945. He was in very poor health, and although he wanted to return and, and repeat this trip, he was never able to, as a matter of fact. So uh, this is the story behind Alamucci, one day that he, where Al Mucci became very famous, the, the people who were here, you know, the, the press, they really didn't know what to do because if, if even to this day there really isn't very much that's right around here. There's a sizable walk to actually get into the town of Al Mucci, but um, if you go that way, uh, but the other three directions, there's there's nothing really you could go to. It would be uh, we're talking about miles and miles to get to anything. So, but that was one day where Al Mucci at least became. Um, focal point for the, for the President of the United States. Um, now, there's one other detail I want to go into about um, uh, this particular trip, because the, the reason why I bring that up at all is because uh, Roosevelt became the only president to ever go under the cutoff. There's no president either standing or one who would be a future president or one who was dead. I mean, there have been funeral trains as well, but um, under no circumstances had there ever been a president that has gone over the, the cutoff that we're aware of, at least not yet. Maybe one after it's reactivated, we never know. But uh, there was one presidential candidate who went over it, he didn't win, um, and that was Adlai Stevenson. He over, went over the cutoff uh, on October 3rd, 1956. Uh, he was going from Hoboken to Scranton, as a matter of fact. And uh, Stevenson was the Democratic candidate running against President Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was quite popular, uh, um, a popular war hero who had led uh, the D-Day invasion uh, earlier in the year of 1944, going back to uh, Roosevelt's trip to here. But in 1956, uh, Adlai Stevenson uh, he didn't win. Uh, but he became the one, at least at, at this point, the one and only presidential candidate ever to travel over the cutoff, once again, that we're aware of. So just a little bit of trivia there. Um, so on to our next stop, which will be the underpass uh, underneath the, the, the cutoff where the Lehigh and Hudson River crosses underneath.
Here we are on the right of way of the Lehigh and Hudson River Railway, where it crosses under the cutoff and the Pequest Fill. So I'm going to do a little bit of a chronology here. The Lehigh and Hudson River Railway opened between Great Court, New York, and Belvedere, New Jersey in 1882, obviously long before the cutoff was here. Trains would run as far as eastern Pennsylvania, but it was on trackage rights over the Pennsylvania Railroad, railroad uh, the, the Beldell Line, or Beldell Branch, or Beldell, the Belvedere Delaware Railroad, basically. Now, um, when the cutoff was being built, which is 1908 through 1911, uh, there was a cement plant over here. And as a matter of fact, the, what's significant about these different railroads we're seeing as we go along, uh, as we go across the cutoff, so to speak, uh, uh, these were used as conduits for building materials. Uh, would have been for like plywood, and well, concrete, you know, cement, um, and uh, even possibly not necessarily carting away fill, but uh, any, anything that having to do with construction could have possibly come in like for here, via the Lehigh and Hudson River Railway. Now, uh, we've already talked about uh, FDR coming through here. He would have passed through this tunnel um, on his uh, way to Hyde Park in the Ferdinand Magellan. That was his, the, the car that he rode in. Now, as we fast forward in time, this location uh, would be, become a rather interesting possibility, if you will. Back in the day, when we're talking now, uh, at the time of the merger of the Erie and the Lackawanna in 1960, uh, the, there was the Erie side and the Lackawanna side. This was the Lackawanna side. The Lackawanna side meaning that uh, the line from Hoboken um, through Summit, Dover, Lake Apatcom, the cutoff, uh, the, the Delaware Water Gap, the Poconos, Scranton, Binghamton and then west of there, but we'll talk about Hoboken and Binghamton in this particular um, discussion. The Erie had a basically a Hoboken to um, Binghamton line as well, although that one went far north of here um, through like Hohokus and uh, Ridgewood, uh, Warwick, Port Jervis, and then up um, across Daruka Viaduct, and then finally to Binghamton. Well, why am I bringing this up? Well, the Erie side, so to speak, uh, was 25 miles longer between those two points, Hoboken or Jersey City and Binghamton. At the beginning of the Erie Lackawanna in 1960, the Erie Lackawanna management decided that they wanted to run basically all their freight traffic over the Erie side via Port Jervis. And except for the passenger service, there was really nothing going on on the Lackawanna side. By 1970 or so, uh, the, where this, uh, the end of this line near Gray Court would have been used as a conduit to what they called the uh, New England Gateway, um, that changed because of a, um, a merger of the, the Penn Central, the Penn Central merger. Without getting into great detail, what happens is that there's a plan to move all of the freight traffic, which is now, at, we're talking in now the early 70s, was traveling over through Port Jervis to move it all back here onto, I'll call it onto the cutoff and the, on the Scranton route or the Lackawanna side, so to speak. Well, what happens here is that the, uh, the Erie Lackawanna looks into having a connection made between, well, basically Greendale, which is a couple of miles in this direction west, and in a ramp that would go on to the Lehigh and Hudson River Railway going north. Why would they, why would the EL do that? Well, the Erie Lackawanna was in desperate straits in those days, and they were looking to save money wherever they possibly could. They were seriously considering the abandonment of the whole Erie side, or at least a significant portion of it, uh, certainly, um, there was no 
set place where they would abandon, but we would think at Port Jervis or West, or, uh, we don't know. But in any case, the plan would be that not only would they run all the trains via the, the Lackawanna side, but also that the trains um, to serve what little was left of traffic on the Erie side would be run via the uh, Lehigh and Hudson River Railway as a, a basically a connector. Well, that didn't happen as it turned out. They would have to have upgraded this line and um, they'd have to build the ramp and probably the cost blew it out of the water, but it was something that was absolutely planned. I've seen plans for it. It was a serious plan, but um, uh, never came to fruition. Now, fast forwarding even further, well, I'm not going to talk about this part because it's going to come up in another episode, but uh, the Lehigh Hudson River Railway will play a significant part in the transfer of the cutoff into not only private hands, but also into state hands. So that's a little bit of a teaser for a future episode. So we now, uh, we're, we're finished here at Lehigh Hudson River Railway. Our next stop is, we're going to go quite a bit west from here. We're actually going to, our next stop, the next railroad, which goes underneath the cutoff, goes on to the Paulins Kilvia Duct in Haynesburg, New Jersey. So on to Haynesburg we go. Here we are at Haynesburg, New Jersey, Paulins Kilvia Duct, the right of way of the Lehigh and New England Railway, and the New York, Susquehanna and Western, formerly the Blairstown Railway would run through here. The Lehigh New England, as was pointed out several times in the past, ran, didn't actually own this particular railroad right-of-way. It actually used what are called trackage rights. They paid a fee to run their trains through here. Now, in a previous episode, the last episode, I mentioned that there was I, I, I sort of implied that there was something going on with the Lehigh and New England, and there was. There actually was a plan for the Lehigh and New England Railway to have its own right-of-way. And at our next stop, we're going to take a look at where that would, would have been, at least in terms of where it crossed the cutoff. Uh, that would never happen, as it turns out, but uh, there's evidence that it could have happened, certainly. Uh, in terms of the way this particular area sets up in terms of railroads, down the, the road a piece here, or down the trail a piece, is what was called Haynesburg Junction. Now Haynesburg Junction is where the Lehigh and New England branched off and went basically southwest. The New York, Susquehanna and Western, or the Blairstown Railway, Railway went straight towards Delaware. Now, if we follow the New York, Susquehanna, and Western towards Delaware, there was yet another junction which took place just about where Route 80 is today. And at that point, the New York, Susquehanna, and Western made a, a right turn into and went into Columbia, which we'll take a brief look at, uh, at least from a distance. So all these railroads are branching out and essentially trying to get around the uh, the uh, the edge, shall we say, of Kittatinny Mountain, which is part of the Delaware Water Gap. Um, the cutoff, uh, on, on the other hand, basically went right straight through. So it didn't have that problem in terms of having to deal with the topography here. Although, as you can see, the, the, the answer to the topography was to build this massive structure to cross over this particular valley and then continue on beyond here. So. Um, our next stop will be at a place called Tunnel Field, and we'll find out why it's called Tunnel Field. Here we are at Tunnel Field in Knowlton Township, New Jersey. I am standing on what would have been the right-of-way of the Lehigh and New England Railway had they decided to build their own right-of-way between Haynesburg and I think Swartzwood Junction. Uh, much further north of here. Uh, the line would have gone through Blairstown and in fact there are certain places where uh, you can see where a little bit of excavation was done. Uh, here it's been totally obliterated what would have been done. You can see 
On the right hand side is the, the tunnel or the underpass that was created in anticipation that when the cutoff was being built that there was a possibility that the LNNE was going to use this right of way. Well, it, it did not, but um, the, the Lackawanna had to at least uh, preserve the, the integrity of the right of way just in case uh, the LNNE ever opted to use it. To the left is today's Route 94, New Jersey Route 94 here in Warren County. So this is a right of way that was never used. There are stories that the uh, during the construction and afterwards that there might have been some storage of uh, of cars for the Le uh, Lehigh and New England. There was trackage that extended from the Lehigh New England, uh, which is actually down the road a piece. The the actual right of way that goes into Pennsylvania uh, that might have been used. Uh, we don't have photos to prove that, but uh, stories go that possibly there might have been uh, cars that might have gone underneath the, the cutoff here, but it was never used as a railroad per se. So this is the, the one place in the cutoff that where the trains could have run but never did. So uh, our next stop is going to be south of here, just to give you a little bit of orientation, because actually, quite frankly, and we'll show you a map, quite frankly, it can get rather confusing as to where the, the tracks for the different railroads go. The cutoff is easy, it just goes straight through, but the other railroads circled around and uh, it actually is needs a little bit of an explanation. Not too much, but a little bit of an explanation as we move our way towards Pennsylvania. Okay, here we are, still in Knowlton Township, still on the Lehigh New England Railway right away, although this is the real one. In other words, this was the one that actually was used up until 1961. Uh, the Lehigh New England has an interesting history. Uh, it opened in 1895 and went through here uh, and was abandoned in its entirety in 1961. It was the, only the second railroad in the United States to be abandoned in its entirety. Uh, the first one was the uh, New York, Ontario and Western, as a matter of fact, and that was 1958, or 57, sorry. So you can see here, it, if you can imagine a, tr a train track through here, it looks a little bit like a, a railroad right-of-way. What I'm going to do is have us turn around and we're going to look in this direction. This right of way continued and actually across on a bridge and continued the bridge con to continue over the Delaware River and into Portland, Pennsylvania. If you can imagine, the New York, Susquehanna, and Western was actually following approximately where Route 80 is, which is down below us here, and going around into the town of Columbia and then around and around and eventually to our next stop, which will be Simpson Road, where the, the New York, Susquehanna, and Western went under the cutoff. Um, because of the topography here, the railroads, in order to prevent having uh, extreme grades, had to go around about. As I mentioned, the cutoff was man managed to circumvent that because it just stayed up high and just kept going straight. So the difference between when you spend a lot of money and build a, a railroad that basically overcomes the uh, surrounding train as opposed to when you, I don't say build on the cheap, but where you build a, a railroad that more or less is subject to the uh, surrounding terrain. And that's where the Lehigh New England and to even a greater extent the New York Susquehanna, which is going way the heck out of the way because it, um, it they, well, they didn't probably have the money in order to spend for something like the cutoff. Anyway, our next stop is Simpson Road, which sounds like, well, what does that mean? Well, you'll see where Simpson Road is in relation to the cutoff. Here we are on Simpson Road in Knowlton Township, New Jersey, where it goes underneath the, the cutoff. 
This is the right of way of the former New York Susquehanna and Western Railway. If you look in this direction, we're looking towards Columbia, New Jersey. As I mentioned, the railroad circles around and actually goes through Columbia and ends up here, continues on sort of parallel, maybe even on the, the right of way of Route 80 to some extent, through the water gap, into Pennsylvania, Stroudsburg, uh, Pocono Pines, all the way to a place called Suscon, which is near Wilkesbury, which is near Scranton, as a matter of fact, uh, as the Wilkesbury and Eastern Railway, which was the railroad as it was called in Pennsylvania. It was a different operation, but basically the same railway. Uh, this was all abandoned in 1940. Uh, it went out very early. There wasn't very much traffic, and as a result, it was abandoned early. If you do a pan, you can see the relationship of where we are right now to a rather well-known object. So obviously the Delaware River Viaduct, our next stop on the Pennsylvania side of the Delaware River Viaduct to look at two more railroad rights of way. Here we are under the Delaware River Viaduct in Pennsylvania. Two different railroads, and I use that in quotes, passed underneath the viaduct here. The old road, the Lackawanna Old Road, which goes to Slateford Junction, which is just up the road a piece. And then the Stroudsburg, Water Gap, and Portland Traction Railroad, or company, had its line, it was basically a trolley line, which went between that arch or underneath that arch. The trolley line lasted only a total of 15 years through here. It opened in October of 1911, probably around the time that the bridge at Slateford Road going over the cutoff at Slateford Junction opened because it used the, the Lackawanna's overhead bridge to go over the cutoff. The trolley line only lasted until 1926 when the Lackawanna canceled its lease for the right-of-way, which I guess it was leasing from the Lackawanna, uh, through the water gap. So that's probably a very short-lived, probably one of the most short-lived traction lines or trolley lines in history. They're probably a shorter-lived ones, but that one's pretty short-lived at 15 years. So. Uh, one more stop, it'll be for the same trolley line, and it'll be at Slateford Junction. Here we are at Slateford Junction. Obviously the western end of the cutoff, and the one place where rails went over the cutoff. On this road, it's not a bridge anymore, at least not at this point in time, as I mentioned in a previous episode. The right away has been filled in after the bridge was replaced back in 1990 by PennDOT. Uh, eventually it will be replaced and there will be another bridge. But the trolley line went across this bridge, crossed over the cutoff, unlike the other railroads uh, that uh, crossed the cutoff. As you can see, the Delaware River is running a little high. A few cars here for the, the Delaware Lackawanna. Uh, but that's... That, that's our episode, the episodes on rails under and over the cutoff. So I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope that you look forward to part 10 of the Lackawanna Cutoff.